Ecclesiastes chapter 2. I'm going to begin reading. If you got a real Bible, it will read like this. I said in mine heart, Go to now, I will prove thee with mirth. Therefore enjoy pleasure, and behold, this also is vanity. I said of laughter, it is mad. And of mirth, what doeth it? I sought in mine heart to give myself unto wine, yet acquainting mine heart with wisdom, and to lay hold on folly, till I might see what was that good for the sons of men, which they should do under the heaven all the days of their life. I made me great works, I built me houses, I planted me vineyards, I made me gardens and orchards, and I planted trees in them of all kind of fruits. I made me pools of water, to water therewith the wood that bringeth forth trees. I got me servants and maidens, and had servants born in my house. Also I had great possessions of great and small cattle above all that were in Jerusalem before me. I gathered me also silver and gold, and the peculiar treasure of kings and of the provinces. I got me men singers and women singers, and the delights of the sons of men as musical instruments, and that of all sorts. So I was great and increased more than all that were before me in Jerusalem. Also my wisdom remained with me. And whatsoever mine eyes desired, I kept not from them. I withheld not my heart from any joy, for my heart rejoiced in all my labor, and that was my portion of all my labor. Then I looked on all the works that my hands had wrought, and on the labor that I had labored to do. And behold, all was vanity and vexation of spirit, and there was no profit under the sun. And I turned myself to behold wisdom and madness and folly. For what can the man do that cometh after the king, even that which hath been already done? Then I saw that wisdom excelleth folly as far as light excelleth darkness. The wise man's eyes are in his head, but the fool walketh in darkness. And I myself perceived also that one event happeneth to them all. Then said I in mine heart, as it happeneth to the fool, so it happeneth even to me. And why was I then more wise? Then I said in mine heart that this also is vanity. For there is no remembrance of the wise more than of the fool forever. Seeing that which now is in the days to come shall all be forgotten. And how dieth the wise man? as the fool. Therefore I hated life, because the work that is wrought under the sun is grievous unto me, for all is vanity and vexation of spirit. Yea, I hated all my labor which I had taken under the sun, because I should leave it unto the man that shall be after me. And who knoweth whether he be a wise man or a fool? Yet shall he have rule over all my labor wherein I have labored, and wherein I have shewed myself wise under the sun. This is also vanity. Therefore I went about to cause my heart to despair of all the labor which I took under the sun. For there is a man whose labor is in wisdom, and in knowledge, and in equity. Yet to a man that hath not labored therein, shall he leave it for his portion. This also is vanity and a great evil. For what hath man of all his labor, and of the vexation of his heart, wherein he hath labored under the sun? For his days are sorrows, and his travail grief. Yea, his heart taketh not rest in the night. This also is vanity. There is nothing better for a man than that he should eat and drink, and that he should make his soul enjoy good in his labor. This also I saw, that it was from the hand of God. For who can eat, or who else can hasten hereunto, more than I? For God giveth to a man that is good in his sight wisdom and knowledge and joy, but to the sinner he giveth travail to gather and to heap up, that he might give to him that is good before God. This also is vanity and vexation of spirit. Dear Lord, now be with my words. I pray, God, that you would uh, just preach well-pleasing in your sight through me. Lord, use me. According to your own will, in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Vanity of labors. Vanity of labors is what we'll be talking about today. Ecclesiastes chapter 2 continues in the vein of Ecclesiastes chapter 1. Obviously, it's the same context. It's the same message through and through. 
He begins, as we talked about last week, coming out as the preacher. As This is the uh, uh, thoughts of the preacher. This is the wisdom of the preacher. This is the inward uh, being of the preacher coming out onto paper, which was later anointed by and preserved as the scriptures. God breathed. Vanity of vanities, all is vanity is what he came out saying. And now he's going to talk about the vanity of labors or even the vanity of pleasures. Because too often our, our labors are towards the direction of the pleasures that we will receive of them. I like how it all ends when he says, he says, um, there is nothing better for a man, this is verse 24, than that he should eat and drink and that he should make his soul enjoy the good in his labor. Too often we want to enjoy the good of our labor. We want to enjoy the fruits of our labor. What comes afterwards, right? We get the big paycheck. We buy the fancy things. We buy the toy. We buy the house. We buy all those things afterward. It's the fruits of our labor. And yet the preacher here says after he rounds it all out in his discoveries that he made in regard to looking at mirth, looking at pleasures, looking at the great works, looking at everything he had done, all of the labors that he had done, he said we need to rejoice in the labors, as we are doing them, as we are working, as we are toiling, not to see the end, not to seek the end. We know if not if we're even going to have tomorrow whereby we can spend of the fruits of our labors, correct? And so eat and drink and enjoy while you're in the labors. That's the charge that he makes when all is said and done. He begins this chapter and he says, I said in mine heart, verse 1, I will prove thee with mirth. Therefore, enjoy pleasure. He said in his heart, I will prove thee with mirth. He is talking within his heart unto his heart. His very being is now communing with itself and it's saying, I will prove thee. I will demonstrate. I will try thee. I will establish thee, my heart, with mirth. And mirth is simply this. It's simply a, a, a rejoicing that comes by means of laughter, essentially is what mirth would be described as. It is, it is a rejoicing of the spirit that quite often comes and, and manifests itself as laughter. We're going to continue down, and I, I think the understanding here and what he's doing is he's simulating in his own life, though he were the king of Israel, and though he is a saved individual, he is starting to act out what I deem the, the find myself moment. This midlife crisis that so many people come across where suddenly they find this intense desire to find themselves. I'm going to go out and I'm going to find myself. And these midlife journeys quite often end in destruction. It destroys what has always been. Do you know where this quite often plays out? Where, where the wife gets, gets bitter about where she's at in life and she reflects and says, oh, things could have been so much different had I done such and such and such. And she plays this out in her mind to the point where she can't take it anymore and now she's off to find herself. Men do the same thing, where they, where, they, where they maybe buy an expensive car in order to satisfy that missing craving of that midlife identity crisis that they're seeking after. And they'll do the same thing to the wife. You know, they'll run off with some young thing and then leave the wife and leave the child and do all those things because they're finding themselves. Because they're proving their own, their own hearts with mirth. They're enjoying pleasure according to the vanity that's about to be described. How often do you hear that? I need to go find myself. What they're saying is, I need to, in this present moment, please myself. I'm sick of pleasing everybody else around me. I need to find mirth in my life. I need to find that pleasure in my life. And now I'm off to find that. Too often people these days, they dissociate what their present identity should be, and that's in the relationships around them that they build. I am who I am because of my parents, because of my wife, because of my child. That all emboldens and embodies who Josh Gander is. My relationship, my association one with another, with people around me, is, is truly what makes up my personal <coughs> identity. And yet too often people these days are associating their identity, not with who they are, but with what they do. You see people that are like, I am a welder. That's what I am. And then their job lays them off. And what are they? They're nothing. Right? The people that, I am a housewife. And then the kids grow up and they leave. Well, then what are you now? 
We associate our identity with what we do, and this is wrong. And this is why when a catastrophe happens in midlife, or the kids move out, or the situation changes, things aren't the same as they were the day before, the week before, the month before, the year before, right around that midlife crisis when suddenly everything is changing, right? Women are, are facing uh, physical changes. Men are now leaning towards retirement. Uh, jobs change. People change. Kids move out. The situation changes, and it comes so abruptly on people because we're so used to routine that when what I do suddenly changes, I have no identity of myself. I don't know what I am because I've tied it all up in what I have done. We need to tie up on a worldly carnal level our persona within the framework of who we interact with, of who we are amongst people. It needs to be associated with an outward vantage point. Okay, well, to the Christian, that just sounds very worldly and carnal. I believe that would solve the problem if they related what they were with their relationship around them and built on that in the worldly sense. But Christians ought to have the mentality that our identity is not with who we are amongst people in this world. Our identity is Christ himself. Amen. Galatians Amen. chapter 2 and verse 20 says, Amen. I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life that I live, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. That yet not I mentality needs to be prevalent in Christians. That way when we're shaked, my life is all in turmoil, my life is falling apart. Well, my life is in Christ. And Christ is a solid rock and he ain't going nowhere. Amen. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. Jesus is the same. We just sang that today. And that is where identity, our identity needs to reside. It right. needs to reside in heaven. We need to identify as crucified with Christ, dead yet alive unto God Amen. through him. That is where the Christian's identity needs to be. And that way, when my job changes, when my kids grow up and leave the house, when I, when I, when I, I, I go to a different church, when, when, when my, my wife uh, passes, away, when all sorts of things happen in people's lives that shake them to the core, the Christian doesn't move because he's always on the rock. And this is why you'll see situations in Christian's life, you're like, what in the world, how could they ever go through this? You look at Job, you look at his character story in, within that. He didn't budge because he was fixed on the solid rock of Christ, on the solid rock of God Almighty as he knew him at the time. And that's why Job didn't budge. He didn't wink at the situations that were for him, but rode the storms unto the end and was blessed many times, many fold over and over because of his steadfastness in the things of God. His identity was in God. All may change, but Jesus never. Glory to his name. Everything can change in this world, and if you're firmly fixed in the solid rock of Christ, you will not budge. And that's where our identity needs to be, according to Galatians chapter 2 and verse 20, and many other like verses that talk about being dead in Christ, nevertheless risen again. We need to understand that and reckon those things to be true and practically live out as if that were the case. But here we see in Solomon's journey, he is seeking to uh, seek and search out by wisdom all things. He mentioned that in the previous chapter in verse 14. He said he wants to seek and search out by wisdom all things. He wants to understand the sword travail of this life. And to do so, it almost seems like what he does is he shuts off that spiritual switch. He's like, he's like a, a scientist at this moment. He's going to be a, a case study actor where he's going to give himself fully unto what men do and how men exercise within the sword travail that God has given him in order to grow in his wisdom and his understanding of things. He shuts off the spiritual. And he says this in verse 3. He says, Till I might see what was that good for the sons of men. He is trying to see what was that good for the sons of men that they should do under heaven all the days of their life. What do men need to do that it will be good for them all the days of their life? And so he's going to come down from the kingly castle and he's going to understand what men go through, what men seek after, what men do, right? Again, a picture of Christ 
coming down from heaven to understand and therefore live that life with men, amongst men, right? Not subject unto sin, as we know Solomon was definitely prone to, but that picture still holds true. The king comes down from his vantage in order to live among men. And Solomon takes it to the point where he says he's going to see what was that good for the sons of men. Really, from the Christian vantage point, it's probably the most dangerous thing that you can do to, 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 to taste a little of the sinful world, to reach in, to put one toe in the water, as Solomon did, as, as he was wont to do in this situation. But what we should be doing is we should be seeing what was that good for not the sons of men, but the sons of God. We need to understand what is good for the Christian and what should be done by the Christian. And those are the things, those are the things we ought to seek after. That good work that we should walk in after we're saved, according to Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 10, that is what a spiritual man should seek after. This is why you kind of see what Solomon's doing here. He's sort of turning that off. He, he's a saved Christian, but he is going to prove thee with mirth. He's going to understand, establish his heart with mirth, enjoying pleasure, and he says, behold, this is vanity. Of course it's vanity. Of course it's vain. Any Christian, any believer of any time frame understands that this is a vain endeavor and will no doubt end in destruction but this is what his trial this is what his journey is going to entail to find out the purpose of life let's say or to find what is good for men what they should do under heaven Solomon had to get into that carnal mindset. He needed to come down and live amongst men and understand men. We gotta remember that Solomon was born a king's son, and so he was always enthroned in the palace, right? As the Lord was always within heaven when he stepped down to this earth. Solomon did the same thing in a like picture where he stepped down from his great prestige, his high and loftiness, from his appointed position, from birth, in other words, from as far back as Solomon existed, right? Jesus, no comparison, because he didn't have a beginning. He didn't have an end, right? But Solomon, again, in this kind of microchasm framework, as he comes out and he lives amongst men, he needed to do it with that carnal mindset. He's got that scientist mentality. That's why you read about Solomon. You say he, he knew great things about plants and about wildlife and about birds and beasts. And he understood many things, not just spiritual things, but he had a great grasp of the world around him because he was a scientist at heart. He, he sought after wisdom. That was the first thing he prayed for. I need to know wisdom that I can lead about this people. He used that wisdom to grow in many other areas of his life. Now, as an experiment, he steps down and he says this, he says, go to now, I will prove thee with mirth. Go to, where have you heard that before? Go to now, I will. First of all, we know that I will is a dangerous statement to make because that was what Satan said as he was the angel Lucifer before he fell from heaven. I will, I will, I will, I will, I will, right? It's a very dangerous mindset. If God will, it should be more of the statement of the believer, right? Amen. We need to rest in the position that, hey, I'm could have planned to do something perhaps, but God may shift that. So if God will such and such, I'm gonna to get to work, I'm gonna live my I'm gonna do my job, I'm gonna come home, I'm gonna get in the car. That's my plan for today is to do that full circle. If God will, right? That's the that, that's the position that the Christian always needs to be in. But he says this, he says, go to now I will. Remember Babylon? Do you remember when the whole world was united under one speech and one tongue? And the whole world was united under one endeavor? And that endeavor was to reach unto heaven by building that great tower. And they made the statement, go to, let us. Go to, let us. It's that same position where it's go to, I will, go to, let us. It's man-centered, man-focused, me, me, my, my, I, I. It's that same mentality that is so carnally focused that it takes God completely out of the equation. So I said, I think Solomon's kind of turning a switch here. He's going to live the carnal life so that he can what? See what was that good for the sons of men. 32 times in this chapter you find the word I. I, 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 I. And yet it falls short of mentioning the Lord. It falls short by a long shot of mentioning anything to do with spirituality, to do with God Almighty, to do with anything of that. But it's an I, 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 me, 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 my, my, my chapter. It's completely man, completely carnally focused. He is going to prove his own heart with what? Rejoicing laughter, with pleasures, and with such other things. 
So what kind of things did Solomon seek after? First we see mirth. That's that amusement expressed in laughter. Verse 2 says, I said of laughter, it is mad. And of mirth, what doeth it? So it's madness, it's insanity, it's vanity, this laughter. What doeth it? Nothing. It, it, it's, just, it's just a, a noise, a sound, a vain thing. Proverbs chapter 14, verse 13 says, Even in laughter, the heart is sorrowful, and the end of that mirth is heaviness. So there we don't need Webster's to define what mirth is. We can see right in that chapter, the end of that laughter, right? Mirth, the end of that laughter. The Bible, again, just defines itself within the context of the scriptures. What is it saying? It's saying that even when you're laughing, it's often just an outward show. That, you know, how long, how often can you, can you get somebody to laugh when they're really sad? We do it all the time with the toddler. He's crying and he's laughing. We're like, don't laugh and cry at the same time. Your face will break. We poke fun at him, right? But people do that too, where they can be really sad and then something makes them laugh and they, you know, for that moment they break from that, that crying, but their heart is still sorrowful. And that's why vanity, madness, what doeth it? Nothing. That's what mirth is. It's nothing. It's empty. How many times do you hear about a comedian committing suicide? And everyone's like, it's so tragic. This guy was a funny guy. And all he did was make people laugh. All he did was laugh. He seemed so happy. In laughter, the heart is sorrowful. Amen. What, is, what do with it? It does nothing. It's vanity. It's madness. It's insanity. It's craziness. And that's why all of these funny men end up killing themselves because within their dead, cold, and nothingness. They, they spend their whole lives making people happy, making people rejoice. But they even themselves know that their, their, their laughter that they're distributing unto others is but for a moment. Those people come in depressed and, and cold and alone and sad and whatever baggage they're carrying. They sit in a comedy club and somebody makes them laugh for an hour and then they walk out sad, depressed, cold and alone. Nothing changed. That mirth did nothing for them. And that's exactly what Solomon said. He said, I'll prove thee with mirth, my heart. Therefore, I'll enjoy pleasure. And immediately he says, behold, this also is vanity. There is nothing to it. What doeth it? It's madness. It's nothing. It's folly. The next journey that he has there in verse 3, he says, I sought in mine heart to give myself unto wine, yet acquainting mine heart with wisdom, to lay hold on folly, till I might see what was that good for the sons of men, which they should do under heaven all the days of their life. He is now seeking after wine and yet acquainting himself with wisdom. My presumption, given all that we've discussed about the I, I, me, me, and him trying to come down and disconnect, was that that wine was alcoholic. He came down to a point where he was going to taste of wine, right? That's the more cultured beverage the world will tell you. That's the more sophisticated beverage the culture and the world will tell you. Wine is a mocker and strong drink is raging and those that are deceived thereby are not wise. Don't let the world fool you into thinking that wine, alcoholic wine, is somehow more sophisticated. It's twice as alcoholic as beer. It'll ruin your life, it'll ruin your family, it'll ruin everything and destroy you in the end. You drink it, you're deceived. You're being lied to. And yet Solomon takes upon himself to give himself unto it, yet acquainting his heart with wisdom. He's like one of those philosophers, one of those Stoics who is taking wine as a way of cooling himself down, relaxing, getting his mind focused in the right framework so that he can, he can really grasp a hold of some things. He can really make some wise decisions, some wise things. But that, that's, a, that's a lie. He, he, he's deceived. He's corrupt. He's, he's ruining himself through that. But he does this, it seems, to get on the same level as those that are in the world. He wants to see what is good for the sons of men. And does not the world teach that, you know, if you're sad, if you're alone, just have a bud stupider, and now all of a sudden you have all these friends, and you're partying, and suddenly you have muscles, and like ladies like you. Like, it, it preaches that foolishness that alcohol is going to somehow make you a better person. And the whole world believes that nonsense, right? They, they work towards their next paycheck so they can go pick up their next drink so that they can go and feel really cool when a sober person will look at them and say, this guy's acting like an idiot, but in his mind he thinks he's so cool, so wise, so smooth as he talks to people. It's a lie. He's deceived. And here Solomon, he takes that alcoholic wine. He tries to study. He tries to be a philosopher. Why? So that he can lay hold on, he can grasp folly. He gets drunk so that he can understand the folly of it all. He gets, he gets drunk so that he can understand how stupid people are for doing that thing. 
Solomon, in his experimental mentality, and his mindset for really grasping what the sons of men experiences, goes to the point of drinking, trying to maintain his wisdom, and ends up grabbing hold of folly. He ends up understanding just how stupid it is to drink that junk. It says in verse 4, he sought after great works. Let's read verse 4. I made me great works. I built in me houses. I planted me vineyards. I made me gardens and orchards and planted trees in them of all kinds of fruits. I made me pools of water to water therewith the wood that bringeth forth trees. Here Solomon is, is becoming that everyman Joe. He's becoming the contractor. He's becoming the, the groundskeeper. He's becoming the, the, the layman. He's becoming the everyday Joe, the plumber, the butcher, the baker, the candlestick maker. He's a worker. He's a, he's a hardworking man, and he's doing all of these, what, great works. He's not doing average works. He's not doing mediocre works. He's getting out there and toiling. Imagine the king coming down to the, to the pauper. And, and working with him. And, and, and you know, it's like that, that, that television show from years ago, Undercover Boss. It's such yeah. a strange thing for the boss to come down and work with them. And yet Solomon comes down and it seems like he, he gets to the point where he starts from the bottom. He's building houses. He's planting vineyards. He's making gardens and orchards. He's doing all those things that before he paid other people to do. He has now become that every Joe, that contractor, that landscaper. He even worked, worked his way up to becoming the boss at that company. Verse 7 says, I got me servants and maidens and had servants born in my house. He already had those things when he was the king and yet now it seems like he's worked and toiled and labored his way. He started a business. He does all these great works around and suddenly he's got servants and maidens and those are, are with him for so long that they actually have children. And he's got all of these people he's taking care of within the framework of the great works that he's doing. He's a hard working man. Verse 7 in the second half of that says, also, I had great possessions of great and small cattle above all that were in Jerusalem before me. He's living the American dream. Look at him. He, he's, he's worked himself from the ground up. He started building houses. Next, he was landscaping these houses. Next, he had servants over him. Next, those servants brought forth children. He, he had longevity of this business. Now he has great possessions because of all that he has done. He has worked. He has toiled. He has labored. He's working that American dream. He's living the dream. He's got the car. He's got the house. He's got the toys. He's got the expensive uh, surround sound system. He's got the swimming pool. He's got everything, and he doesn't have it because he inherited it. This context seems to suggest he has it because he worked his hiney off for it. He worked his tail off. He did what every man ought to do in order to gain those things. And we see that. It's, it's interesting because the men do the same thing. Yeah, they're really hard workers. They're a really great businessmen. They're a really really awesome philanthropists that do all of these things where they work a business up from the bottom. And yet they're from a standpoint where they've been given unto wine. I don't know how many people I've known that have been functional alcoholics where they're drunk off their, off their rocker all night long and then they get up and the next day they work hard, they labor, they run a business, they do all those things. Five o'clock hits, they're home, they're drunk again. And that cycle just never ends. I, I have a friend that committed a suicide last year because of this. And I was so, so sore and so torn but from the outside looking in, you saw this great, successful man that worked in television, that had a nice car, that had a nice house. He had everything. He had that American dream. And yet his family found him in his house, dead, by suicide. There is a sadness and a vanity to that lifestyle, to that cycle of, of drink and work and drink and work and drink and work. And yet that's almost every man. Honestly, that is so many people right now, today. I don't know how many people at work. It's 5 o'clock and I'm like, I can't wait to get home and, you know, let my son wrestle me and, and jump on my head and, and, and do all sorts of fun with him and play with him. And other people are just like, I can't wait to get home and crack a beer. Yeah. It's, it's stupid. It, it's, it's, it's vanity. It's, it's wicked. Give your head a shake. But that's the American dream. That, that's the dream that everyone is chasing after. And that's the dream that, that Solomon here dabbled in. And yet he went beyond that. If we continue in reading verse 8, it says, I gather me also silver and gold and the peculiar treasure of kings and of the provinces. I got me men singers and women singers and the musical and the delights of the sons of men as musical instruments and that of all 
swords. He had silver. He had gold. He had beyond what any man would ever have. He had the peculiar treasure. These things aren't reserved for just anybody. He even said he had his own entertainment team. He had his own musicians. He had his own, his own rock show at his disposal. He could hear his music on and off and on and off, not with a CD player and a surround sound, but he literally had the musicians there and said he had peculiar treasures from far and wide. Not only did he live the American dream, but he went beyond that. He was wealthy. And I believe in this context, again, that wasn't just what was inherited. A lot of what Solomon probably inherited because of David being his father, because of David's heart toward building that temple, but he had bloody hands. I think a lot of Solomon's wealth was actually tied up in moving that temple forward and then building that thing. And so Solomon, it seems, was a very hard worker, and he continued to labor and toil and do great things. But because he was a hard worker, he became rich. And when he became rich, he had accolades from far and wide. He had people coming to him from far parts of the earth, not just because he was the king, but because of his great wisdom, his great knowledge, and his great works. And they were giving him things. He was gathering silver and gold and the peculiar treasure of kings in the provinces. Far and wide, kings would come to him to see him. And that's what happens when people, when they get really rich, they start rubbing elbows with royalty. They start rubbing elbows with really high up there. They're, 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 they're up in the world, right? They're moving on up in the world. And this is exactly what Solomon experienced. Verse 9 says, So I was great and increased more than all that were before me in Jerusalem. Also my wisdom re remained with me. He continued to stay wise as he worked through all these things, as he toiled, as he, as he basically turned off the, the God switch and just became a carnal man. He succeeded and excelled very much at that. More than any that were before him, and the Bible records that it was more than any that were even after him. I believe God gave Solomon this special permit, this special window of time where he would become the greatest in the world in an answer to prayer right back in the beginning of the ministry was so that he could write a book like Ecclesiastes and show us that it is all vanity and vexation of spirit. He lived the dream. He had more than all. He was more than any before them. The Bible records he was more than any after him because after the kingdom split, right? There wasn't the same great kingdom. There wasn't the same great wealth since the days of Solomon. And I believe there never again shall be until the Lord comes. So he had all of these things. Verse 10 says, Whatsoever mine eyes desired, I kept not from them. I withheld not my heart from any joy, for my heart rejoiced in all my labor, and this was my portion of all my labor. So there it is. There's the fruit of his labor, the portion of all of his labors, was that he was able to give his eyes whatsoever they desired. He was able to give his heart whatever joy it desired. He was able to do whatever he felt like as the fruits of his own labors. He worked the American dream and he succeeded at the American dream and he rejoiced in it all right up until the end. But then he looked. Verse 11 says, I looked on all the works that my hands had wrought and on the labor that I had labored to do. And behold, all was vanity and vexation of spirit, and there was no profit under the sun. Solomon had it all. He had the dream. He had what every man desires after, what every man lusts after, craves after. When we think in our heart, what does my heart want? Solomon had it. When I see with my eyes, and I'm like, what do my eyes desire? Solomon had it. He had everything that a man could lust after and want. And yet when he looked back upon it all, he didn't say it was great. It was awesome being that rich. It was awesome having this influence. It was awesome being this wise. He looked upon his works and he said, all was vanity and vexation of spirit. Right. There is no prophet under the sun. Amen. None. Amen. Amen. He looked, he realized vanity, vexation, just as the Lord said. He said, for what shall it profit a man if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? That's right. His relationship with God, his, his stance with God, his position with his Savior, that switch that he turned, had he turned it back, was more valuable than anything he could find under the sun in this world. And he had everything, everything that a man could want. Everything that a young child looks up and says, man, that's what I'm going to be when I grow up. He had it all. Vanity. Vexation of spirit. There's nothing to profit of it. That's right. Amen. Amen. Mark 8, verse 36. What shall it profit a man 
if he should gain the whole world and lose his own soul. That soul is more valuable. That soul and its relationship with Christ. That soul and its unity with the Spirit is of much value. And that is the answer that I believe God opened up the window of opportunity for Solomon to turn that switch, to become carnal, to become successful as a carnal man. He made that opportunity, that provision available so that he could take that scripture in Mark 8, verse 36 and answer it. What shall it profit a man? Nothing. What shall it profit a man? Nil. And compared to having his soul saved, he loses that, he's lost it all. He's taking none of it with him. You've never seen a hearse pulling a U-Haul. You've never seen people with all their possessions and taking them to the graveyard. Do you know what happens? They leave it unto another. And that's it. They're gone. If they have their soul, Christ has it, they have everything. Yeah. If they don't, they got nothing. It profited them nothing. And that's what he did. He turned. He realized that. Verse 12 says this. He says, I turned myself to behold wisdom. And madness and folly. He's reflecting now. He's looking back. He's turned to look at the past. He says, For what can the man do that cometh after the king, even that which hath already been done? I have done it all, he is saying here. And as he turns and he reflects, what does he find out? He's looking at wisdom. He's looking at madness. He's looking at the folly that he willingly took upon himself and gave himself unto. And he says, I saw, verse 13, that wisdom excelleth folly as far as light excelleth darkness. What's that verse saying to me is that is that he looked back on madness, folly, wisdom, and wisdom exceeded it all. The folly went away. It became past tense. The madness went away. It became past tense as he turned and reflected upon it. But that wisdom stayed with him. He had great wisdom and understanding that stuck with him as he looked back at that past life. But he got to look back at it from the position of this. The damage is already done. He looked back and he saw no. folly, vanity, vexation. And now he's here and he's wise and he's understanding. But the damage has been done. We have the great blessing. People always say, you know, learn from your mistakes, right? But what's better is to learn from other people's mistakes and just never make them. Don't you think? Amen. And we have a great blessing. It's called the Word of God. And the Word of God is full of stories just like this. Full of men just like you and I. Full of women just like all of us, right, who are sitting in this room, respectively. Right? We have the stories that give us examples that we can apply to our lives that show us someone else's mistakes. And the best thing we can do is learn from someone else's mistakes and not make those same. Right? We look back and we see someone's folly and someone's wretchedness and someone's wickedness and we behold that and we retain wisdom. And the same thing will happen when somebody lives those things and they tell you, young ones, they tell you, children, don't make the same mistakes I do. Don't do that. Don't take that drink. Don't smoke that cigarette. Don't follow around those, those people. Don't go to that place. And we tell you these things, children. Adults tell you these things, not because they're trying to ruin your fun. They tell you because they're standing on this side with wisdom experience from all the stupid things that they did in the past. And they're saying, don't do that. Don't do that. It will ruin you. It will destroy you. It will wreck you. And you'll be standing here where I am with the damage done. It's already done. All of that past has already ruined what it ruined. And now here I stand. I'm wise. I understand. I know that I had the opportunity to go back and change and I would never have done those things. But the damage is done. <clears throat> Solomon learned, as it says in verse 14, that the wise man's eyes are in his head, but the fool walketh in darkness. And he said, and I perceive also that one event happeneth to them all. So there is no separation between the wise and the fool. They're all going to die, that one event, right? Everybody dies. It's pointed to men once to die. After this, the judgment. <clears throat> but the difference between the wise and the fool is this. The fool walketh in darkness. He's never listened to reproof. He's never listened to doctrine. He's never listened to the scriptures. He's never learned from other people's mistakes and embraced them and said, I'm going to do things differently. He's like this. Right? This is how the fool lives his whole life, you know? He can only feel so far ahead of him to get an understanding of what his surroundings are, what's to come, 
from his decisions that he's making right now. Every step is a blind one, and who knows what, what is to come. But it says of the wise man that his eyes are in his head. Listen, everybody's, well, yeah, but do you, are you using them like that? Are your eyes linked with your head? Is your brain leading your eyes? Are you thinking before you walk? Are you seeing and interpreting and discerning and doing the right thing because you look and you behold and you know that that will lead to death. You know that that will lead to vanity. You know that that will lead to corruption. Your parents have told you. The Bible's told you. Wisdom has been given you. You hear. You understand. You see. And you walk in that wisdom. The wise man's eyes are in his head. He is seeing. He is thinking. He is interpreting. He is understanding. Don't be as that fool that walketh in darkness. Though the same event happeneth to them both, the wise live a life where they can watch and behold. And you too can learn from those that see and get an understanding by vision and thinking, using your brain, and make the right decision. And therefore, then you won't look back and have so many regrets, have so much damage when you stand here 20 years from now. <clears throat> Solomon got to the point, as it says in verse 17, he says, therefore, I hated life. Because the work that is wrought under the sun is grievous unto me. For all is vanity and vexation of spirit. So men die that same death, whether they're wise or whether they're a fool. And the Bible says in verse 16 that there is no remembrance of the wise more than the fool forever. Seeing that which now is in the days to come shall be forgotten. And how dieth the wise man? The same way as the fool. When you look at the two, they're both passing away in the same way. And yet the people that are living could have taken from the fool and taken from the wise. And they could have gained something from them. They could have learned something from them and appropriated that response into their lives. Therefore, yes, the ways of the wise can live on, though his remembrance may pass away. And the response of the wise and wisdom in right situations can live on in somebody that embraces it, thinks and looks and uses those situations to their benefit to make the right decisions in their life. But Solomon's life, though it was a dream, though he had the pleasure, the wine, the peculiar treasures, the great possessions, the great works, he died just like the rest of them. And that was it. Now all we have of Solomon is the record that God has given us. There is no remembrance in this world of a man named Solomon, or very little. And if there was more evidences, they wouldn't give it to, right? They wouldn't give it to us to behold it. But what we have is the tale that was told in truth from the scriptures that God has given to us as a revelation that we can look and think and live with our eyes within our heads, with that understanding that we have. We can learn from him that way we don't end up on the other side of life hating it, hating our life, seeing it as vanity, as wickedness, seeing it as grievousness. Solomon continued in verse 18, he said, Yea, I hated all of my labor which I had taken under the sun. He said, Because I should leave it unto another man that shall come after me. And who knoweth whether he be a wise man or a fool? Yet shall he have rule over all my labor, wherein I have labored, and whenever I showed myself wise under the sun, this is also vanity. He's like, this is all vain. Anything that I have gained is going to be lost. Is, is the guy coming after me a fool or is he wise? Anything that I have understood with wisdom is lost. It, it's, it's going to the fool or it's going to the wise. I don't know what's going to happen with all of this that I have gained, all of this which I have attained. And therefore he hated his life and he hated labor. Great depression came from this, just like it promised in verse 18 of the previous. For in much wisdom is much grief, and he that increaseth knowledge increaseth sorrow. This came to full fruition in his life. And these possessions were left to another. This wisdom was left to another. And, and it was just this. It was just gone. Poof. Vanity. Therefore I went about to cause my heart to despair of all the labor which I had taken under sun. That was verse 20. He caused his heart. He dwelt within that sorrow. He's an experimental scientist. He really wants to understand the vanity of it all. And so he's given himself now fully over to that mourning, that despair within his heart over all that he had done. As if hopefully his experience in the book of Ecclesiastes could do some good and live on afterwards. But here's the problem. Here's the problem. It's all vain. Look at verse 21. It says, There is a man whose labor is in wisdom, and in knowledge, and in equity. Yet to a man that hath not labored therein shall he leave it for his portion. This also is vanity and a great evil. This is talking about leaving a great wealth that you've earned 
unto your family, unto your sons, unto your daughters. It's a great evil, the Bible says. It's talking about the wisdom that you have had, you have labored for, you have imparted unto your family, unto your friends, those who come after you. It's great evil. Well, why is that? Isn't it great to leave a big inheritance to your family? It makes wicked people. It makes people that have no understanding of what it actually means to labor, to work hard, to learn something, to, to find knowledge, to seek after wisdom. When people just inherit that stuff, it is vanity and a great evil. And that is clear from this scripture. People that don't search the scriptures themselves become evil people. People that just listen to sermon after sermon after sermon after sermon, gaining everyone else's wisdom, and they've never toiled or lifted a finger to get that truth from the scripture, they become evil people. It happens so often, every time. You cannot live by the bread that comes from a preacher's mouth. You cannot live by the bread that comes from some book. You need to live by the bread of the word of God. That's right. Amen. This is where your life is. This is where your eternity lies. This is where your wisdom, your knowledge, your understanding. And this is why I'm so exhorting you guys to get into this scripture is because I can't feed you enough to help you. You will become a wicked, vain person, according to the Bible, if you do not get these things yourself. And that plays out into the world. It's the worst thing that a parent can do to just drop their entire inheritance on their kids, to take care of their kids, never teach them to labor, never teach them to toil, never teach them to lift a shovel, lift a rake. Ladies, never teach your little girls how to, how to work in the kitchen, how to cook anything, but just give, 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 give. Make spoiled, rotten brats who grow up and become spoiled, rotten adults. And the world is just full of them right now. Amen. It is a wicked, great evil and vanity to just inherit those kinds of things. And Solomon understood this, and he mourned about it. He's like, I don't know if the son that comes after me will be wise or if he'll be a fool. I don't know of all the wealth that I have accumulated, that vainness that I have accumulated when I leave it to him, if it'll just destroy him because he's a wise, he's not a wise person, but he's a fool. I don't know any of these things. And therefore, he put in his heart to cause it to despair so that he could pen and record a scripture such as this so that we could understand the truth of what is that good part for man. And our good part is to fear God, keep his commandments. Our good part is to lay ourselves at the feet of Jesus while everyone's toiling about. Our good part is to search the scriptures daily and find out whether these things be so. That's our good part is to understand the will of God and seek it for our lives. Seek him. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all those other things shall be added unto you. And that's the context of this scripture. The apostle Paul learned this and portrayed it to people when he said, Whatsoever state I am in, I have learned. Whatsoever state I am in, therewith to be content. Paul knew how to abound. He knew how to be abased. He knew how to have great. He knew how to suffer one. He knew how, wherever he was in. His rock was Christ. His identity was Christ. And therefore, whatever his circumstances in this world, it did not matter because that was his rock. He was joined with Christ, and therefore he was content with what he had. Verse 22 says this, it says, For what hath man of all his labor, and of the vexation of his heart, wherein he hath labored under the sun? For all his days are sorrows, and his travail grief. Yea, his heart taketh not rest in the night. This also is vanity. This is just another proof of that same scripture where it says, What shall profit a man to gain the whole world and lose his very soul? Every man will have that same labor and vexation with his heart. His days will be full of sorrows. And if it ends in death and hell, it mattered not. It was vanity, vexation. It had no profit whatsoever. Though the same man can go through that same labor and vexation of his heart and spirit, all of his days full of sorrow, and then live unto God when he dies and goes to heaven throughout eternity. And it's your choice to make. But it's all about priorities. Are your priorities fixed upon this world or are your priorities fixed in heaven? Is your rock, your life, what you do, uh, your job, your, your position, your family, is your rock here or is your rock seated in heaven at the right hand of God the Father? You need to choose that this day. There is nothing better, verse 24, there is nothing better for a man than that he should eat and drink 
and that he should make his soul enjoy good in his labor. This is the best thing that a man can do, is eat and drink and labor and rejoice in the labor, and eat and drink and labor and rejoice in that labor. It doesn't talk about the car, the house, the, the, the fancy furniture. It doesn't talk about the television system. It doesn't talk about all of those great things that men lift up as the, the telltale sign that you've made it in this world. No, it says eat and drink and labor and be content in it. Eat and drink and labor and be content in it. And that is the greatest thing. There is nothing better for a man than that he should do these things. This also I saw that it was from the hand of God. And that's the difference. Solomon went out and in his life he worked, he toiled, he lived that American dream. He worked, he made himself great to the point where kings were coming to hang out with him and to chum up with the big house that he built with all his labors. The fruit of all his labors they came to, 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 to enjoy and to share. And yet that was from the hand of Solomon. It was Solomon's own mind. It was Solomon's own doings. It was Solomon's own work. And yet the nothing better that he refers to here is from the hand of God. It is the experience of being with God, of walking with God, of having God be your provider, God be your rock, God be your surety. That is the thing that is greatest to find. Remember how I said that we might see what was that good for the sons of men? That's all the vanity. That's all the wickedness. That's all the... The, the lusts of the flesh, lusts of the eyes, and the pride of life. That which is good for the sons of God is this. Rejoicing in your labor, eating and drinking, and therewith being content. Having therefore food and raiment, let us therewith be content. And the wisest thing that we can do is to learn from others bonehead moves and mistakes. Don't do them. Seek God. Be content with food. Be content with drink. Be content with your life and in the labor that God has given you under the sun. For then you are eating from the very hand of God. Verse 25 says this, For who can eat or who else can hasten hereunto more than I? He's like, I can tell you this. I, can, I am telling you the truth. I am imploring you. Who has eaten like I? Who has hastened there too to that position that everybody's after more than I? Listen, I am telling you the hand of God is there to provide, and you ought to rejoice as you work for Him. Not your boss, because you might get fired. Not, not, your, not your, your, your kids as you, as you raise them up, because they're going to leave, right? Our security and our labors are in Christ, for that's where our identity is. For God giveth to a man that is good in his sight, wisdom and knowledge and joy. It's the gift of God. It's the hand of God that gives you these things. That wisdom, that knowledge, that joy, it's yours because God has imparted those things unto you. But to the sinner, he giveth travail to gather, to keep up, that he may give to him that is good before God. This also is vanity and vexation of spirit. Again, there's that choice. You can choose to walk in the ways of the fool, or you can choose to walk in the ways of the wise. And that is the decision that we get to, we have the opportunity to make each and every day. 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 6 is this, but godliness with contentment is great gain. You want to gain in this world? You want to increase? You want to improve? You want to rise to the top of this world? Be godly. Be content. Be godly. And pair that with contentment. Be godly and couple that with being content and satisfied where you're at. And that is the great gain that the Lord offers. For we brought nothing into this world. That's a reality. That's the truth. And it is certain we can carry nothing out. And having food and raiment, let us be therewith content. That is that good part. That is the best thing, the good of this world has to offer humans, has to offer men, is that they would receive of the good of God given unto them and they would be content to dwell therein. Simply pleasing Him. Simply trusting Him. Simply walking with Him. Not this me, 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 I, 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 but this he, he, him, him. The Father, Jesus, to Him be the glory. Amen. Amen. Amen.